Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. So without further ado, let's, let's get into the Starlink system. I think most of you are at least somewhat familiar how a satellite communication system works. But in all cases, you usually have a space segment and an Earth segment. In this case, a space segment, of course, contains satellites. These satellites are in lower Earth orbit, so they are not geostationary. They fly over us as we speak. Some of these satellites are already equipped with laser links, meaning that they can communicate to each other over a laser. On Earth, we have the user terminal. This is the device you buy as a user that then talks to the satellite and relays your information to other satellites back to Earth to a gateway. These gateways are positioned on multiple locations on Earth and are connected to the regular internet. So in this, in, in this way, you can connect with the internet to the satellite. Now, when I started this research, SpaceX wasn't willing to give me a satellite. So we had to buy ourselves a user terminal. And that's what this talk is focused on. Now, if you think about this um, in another way, if you would, would want to attack a satellite, the easiest way would probably be to first compromise the user terminal. Because you cannot use a regular satellite dish to connect to these satellites. So we ordered one of the user terminals, we put it on the roof of our university building, played with it for 10 minutes, and then got pretty bored. Because there's not much you can do with it. It's just an internet connection. So I started looking around what other people had done, um, or what other people were doing at that point in time. So the top three videos, or um, yeah, the ones at the top of the slide, were already going on when I started my research. So we had Mike on space doing a teardown, showing what was on the inside. He had to be really destructive with his user terminal, but that did make it easier for others to tear down their user terminal in a less destructive way. Then we had Ken Keeter, who went a bit deeper. He removed the metal back shield and described some of the parts on the PCB. The signal pad went a bit further. They described all of the RF components and also um, all of the materials that the dish was made of. Then at the time I was doing my research, some other videos and blog posts came online. So we had Colin O'Flynn doing a teardown and trying some basic fault injection experiments um, live on YouTube, let's say. Oleg Kutkov did a teardown of the Wi-Fi router that you get with the user terminal and did some reverse engineering on it. He also posts a lot of interesting tweets on Twitter um, showing how he's basically repairing user terminals that get broken on the front line in Ukraine. Then on the bottom right, we have Dan Murray, who did one of the first teardowns of the rectangular um, user terminal. And because that's a destructive uh, process, he also built a 3D printable case that you can use to um, yeah, re replace it. Now, I've already mentioned that there's multiple different hardware revisions of this user terminal, but there's very few people that realize how many hardware revisions SpaceX has been going through in this short period of time. So we first had the circular user terminal. That's the same user terminal we have here on stage. It's about 60 centimeters in diameter, and it was meant for residential use. So you can see that there have been quite a lot of hardware revisions here. Um, most of the circular user terminals are commonly referred to as revision one and revision two hardware. But as you can see, there have been multiple variants of these revisions. After that came the square user terminal or the rectangular user terminal, which was meant for residential and RV use. And also here we've seen multiple hardware revisions. Now there's also a high performance user terminal that's only meant for business use and maritime use. And here as well, there have been multiple hardware revisions. Then finally, there's a transceiver unit. Um, there's not a lot of public information on this yet, but you can find some details in the firmware. So here the idea is that you have a transceiver box that is paired with an external um, phased array antenna. When we first ordered the user terminal, we received a Rev2 Proto2 terminal, which contained an, a system on chip, CUT3, meaning it was the third silicon revision of the system on chip. During my research, I broke this user terminal, um, and when we received a new one, it was already a Rev2 Proto4, and this contained the fourth revision of the system on chip. Now, all of the other user terminals that came after Rev2 Proto4 use the SOC CUT4, and the attack that I show in this presentation will just also work on all of the other terminals. Now, as I said, we had the user terminal set up. Uh, we got bored pretty quickly, so we started to open it up. If you remove the plastic backing shell, then you're greeted with this big metal shield. There's only a very small cutout in this that has three connectors. One of them is for power over Ethernet, the other is for the motors, 
So normally the dish will roughly align itself towards satellites and then uses the phased array principle um, to really track a satellite that is flying over. And then finally there was an un unpopulated UART connector. And if you've looked at hardware products before, if you see a UART connector, you always get a bit happy because there might be an easy way into the system. Turns out that wasn't the case here. Um, so we could see a lot of information about the dish while it was booting. So it was using the U-boot bootloader, for example. But as you can also see, SpaceX had disabled all of the serial input. So you could type away at your keyboard and do whatever you want. The user terminal wouldn't actually respond to any of your input. Then when you allow the dish to boot fully, you're greeted with this, with this login prompt. So it says development login enabled, no. Because of course this is a regular dish, it's not development hardware. And it gives you a login prompt. You can actually type usernames and password in, passwords in this prompt, but it will not do anything as long as the dish doesn't believe it is development hardware. So that meant we had to go deeper. So we had to remove the metal backing cover from the PCB. This takes quite a lot of effort and time. Um, so use a heat gun, um, prying tools, and some IPA to dissolve it, to dissolve the glue. Um, and then we can see a few interesting parts on the PCB. So I marked here an area with a GPS receiver. Um, in the middle, there's an area that um, is responsible for creating all of the clocks for all of the other components on the board. There's an area related to the power over Ethernet system. And then finally, the area that we're most interested in for this talk is the area where the main system on chip is. And there's, of course, one part on this entire PCB that I haven't marked, and that's basically all of the other stuff. And all of the other stuff looks like this. It contains a digital beam former made by SD Microelectronics and is codenamed Shiraz. And each of these front -end, uh, beam formers is paired with 16 front end modules, codenamed Pulsar. Now, while I was working on this um, dish, as I said earlier, I broke one, um, but I didn't want to uh, have the entire hardware go to waste, so we desoldered some of these ICs and we sent them off to John McMaster. And John was nice enough to decapsulate these chips for us and then image them. So now these images of these chips are available online and you can view them in high resolution there. Um, there's a few interesting things you can see here. Clearly the, the beamformer chip, also named Shiraz, has these 16 channels, the 16 patterns that repeat in the chip basically. For the front end module, we can see that it's basically um, the same part mirrored twice, and that's a re receive and a transmit pad. Now if we look at the system on chip area on the board, we of course see the main system on chip. This is a custom quad-core ARM Cortex-A53 chip made by ST Microelectronics. Um, as I said, there have been multiple silicon revisions of this chip and it is codenamed Katzen. Then there is a secure element, again made by ST Microelectronics. Uh, and at the end of the presentation, I will give you some more uh, hints as to what this secure element is used for. Then C, or in green, we have a four gigabyte eMMC chip. And finally, we have two four gigabit DDR3 chips. Um, in red marked on the slide are some pull up and pull down resistors that basically um, encode zero or one. And this is used by the dish while it's booting to figure out which of all of these hardware revisions it actually is. And then based on that, a different device tree is used. Now on this previous slide, you can also see that there's this metal cover on top of the main SOC chip. That's an integrated heat spreader. You can remove that. And then you are greeted with um, the backside of the silicon die. And the backside of the silicon die, you can actually make a picture of. In this case, we made the picture uh, in our lab using uh, a laser fault injection station. Um, so this is a 50x magnify magnification of the chip. And this sort of picture can be interesting for a physical attacker to figure out where certain parts of the chip are physically located. So one thing you can see here very clearly in the bottom right are the four CPU cores. And if you maybe want to do a, an EM fault attack that targets the CPU, then it's very um, nice if you know already where it's physically located. Uh, we also donated this picture to the Silicon Prom website, so you can also view it there in high resolution. So of course, the first thing we want to do with any of these embedded devices is basically extract the firmware and then look at the software. Maybe we can find an easy software vulnerability that allows us a way in. In this case, the software is stored on that eMMC chip. Uh, which is basically a, an SD card with more data lines. And all you need to read out an SD card are a clock line, a command line, and a data zero line. Um, there's quite a few test points on this board. So what we did is we solved wires to all of these test points and then looked at a logic analyzer capture. 
And you can always see the clock line is easy to spot. The command line will be the first line to do anything. And then data zero will also be the first data line to respond with data. And once you have these test points, um, you can connect an SD card reader to it and just connect the SD card reader to your PC and read out the chip. In this case, I also had to add a level shifter um, because the EMMC was running at 1 volt 8. Now, this is not the way I would recommend doing this. Uh, this is the way I did it because I was impatient and wasn't willing to wait for the right tools. So what I would recommend you do is you buy this um, low voltage EMMC adapter. They're only 10 or $12 online and they make your life a lot easier. There's multiple other ways of doing, of dumping EMMCs and dumping EMMCs in circuit or doing chip off. So here's a few other ways you could go. There's a lot of phone data recovery slash forensics tools. Um, in my experience, they don't work really well. They're relatively expensive. They're annoying to work with. They only have Windows software. There's licenses involved. It's all very annoying to work with. So I did try the easy JTAG box. It did work, um, but it was relatively unstable. Then Murray tested the Octo Plus Pro box, and he had a similar experience really annoying software, and it was very unstable. Another alternative that might work is the um, T56 programmer, which is the successor of the TL866-2, which is a very popular programmer to dump all sorts of memory chips. Now, if, you, if you're lucky or unlucky, and you have a newer user terminal, a rectangular one, um, then this area of the main system on chip looks like this, and SpaceX removed all of the test points on this newer hardware revision. So here you have to go for the chip off method, meaning that you remove the EMMC chip from the board, put it in an external reader, then reball it and put it back on the board. This sounds complicated, but you should just try it once. It's really not that difficult if you have the right tools. So you use hot air to remove the chip, and then on, on AliExpress, for example, you get one of these jigs shown on the top right, and this makes it really easy to align the stencil on top of the, the BGA balls. Then you use solder paste, spread it over the stencil, Again, use hot air and all of the balls will reform. Then you can put the chip in one of these sockets shown on the bottom right, and again, connect it to an SD card reader and make a dump. You can then also change the data on the EMMC if you want and put it back on the board. Now, once we have a raw dump of the EMMC, it's just one binary blob and we don't really know what is going on. So we have to start pulling it apart. So for this, we can look a bit at the open source um, U-boot code. So SpaceX did release their uh, modifications because U-boot is um, GPL licensed. And you can see there's a lot of partitions and there's a few interesting things we can already see here. So you can see that there's a lot of um, trusted firmware A boot stages that are firmware image packages and these you can unpack with the FIP tool. There's a flattened UI image tree, um, which also had a custom format by SpaceX on top of it that I'll explain later. Um, then there's a runtime image, a calibration, and a calibration. The calibration is user terminal specific, and as you can see, these partitions are DM Verity protected. There's an EDR and config partition that are LUX protected, and LUX keys for these partitions are stored in eFuses. So from this slide, it should already be clear that modifying anything on the EMMC won't really get you very far. The entire system implements secure boot, so modifying something will be detected by um, the ROM bootloader initially, for example, and then it will stop booting and you won't be, do, be able to do anything. So it isn't as simple as just replacing firmware. Now, if you want to look a bit more in, in the firmware itself, then usually you would use a tool like Binwalk and try to extract it. In this case, it didn't work because of some custom error correcting codes that SpaceX has put on top of the standard um, fit image. The reason they did this is presumably because some parts of the code are shared between the user terminal and the satellites, and the satellites are exposed to a bit harsher of an environment, so a bit flip is more likely to happen. This means that each 255 block of data contains 32 bytes of error correcting codes that you want to initially strip away from this. Um, I explained the entire data format in a blog post that you can find online. Now, once you go through the process of once removing all of this ECC data, um, you can actually extract an unECC binary from the firmware, and then, of course, afterwards, you can simply use that um, to remove an ECC, uh, ECC and correct bit flips. Now, there's already a few things that are interesting that we can find in this firmware. Um, there's some very nicely documented scripts, for example, or configuration files. 
So some people have asked me in the past, how does the user terminal handle um, thermal management? So what does it do if it gets too hot? What does it do if it gets too cold? How does it handle that? Well, there's a nice file in the firmware that really explains this in a lot of details with a lot of comments, and it's really nicely structured. So if you want to know that information, then the firmware is the perfect place to start. We can also see all of the RF channels that are being used. So we can see the uplink and downlink frequencies. We can see which channels are, are being combi combined in a pair. And we can even see the frequencies of the lasers that are used in the satellites. We can also find some hidden web pages. So if you connect to the user terminal over a wired Ethernet um, connection, then there are a few web pages that you can find on there. And you wouldn't really know that these web pages exist without first looking at the firmware. So these web pages, some of them are, are meant for, um, I guess, regulatory testing um, and allow some easy controls over the user terminal. But if you have a regular consumer user terminal, you won't be able to use these controls. There's a lot of um, code in the firmware that is used to do telemetry. And SpaceX is, I guess, playing, paying a close eye at what some people are doing with their user terminals. So I know one person that mounted a user terminal inside of their plane because they wanted to have high-speed internet in their plane. This worked up until a few weeks ago when SpaceX started blocking this. But even before that, SpaceX already knew because from the firmware it is clear that if you um, yeah, have too high of an acceleration or too high of an altitude, that an alert will be triggered. Similarly, they keep track of their development hardware. Um, in the past, it has happened. For example, Microsoft had an issue with um, Xbox development kits leaking and then people using those to attack the Xbox network. And that's, of course, something you want to try and avoid. So if, let's say, a developer were to take their user terminal home, and were to use it in a non-development geofence, then an alert would be triggered at the side of SpaceX. You can find all of these geofences defined in the firmware. So the example on the left is a rather obvious example. It's a SpaceX facility, so you are allowed to use development hardware at a SpaceX facility. The one on the right is a bit less obvious. It's the Connections Museum in Seattle, and I'm not really sure why they have access to development hardware. There was another um, example that was called the Snow Ranch, and this was a villa somewhere in the middle of nowhere in the US. But I don't really know who this place belongs to, so I'm not going to disclose the location. Now, I'm not going to say that you should try to get your hands on development hardware. But if you really want, and if you zoom, far, zoom in far enough on Google Maps, you can actually find some of these user terminals sitting on top of a parking lot at a SpaceX facility. So of course, what we want to obtain is we want root. We want root on this user terminal so that we can interact with the network side of things. And maybe we can even try and attack a satellite eventually. I already mentioned that there's this development login enable prompt. And now that we have the firmware, we can start looking at how this is implemented. So you can see in the shell script that it will first print development login enabled. Then it does this is production hardware check. If it's production, non-production hardware, so development hardware, then it prints yes and sets the root password Falcon. Otherwise, it just prints no, and there is no root password set, and you won't be able to log in. Now, if we look at this from a more physical um, perspective, then this is a logic analyzer capture of the development login enabled print. So there's this print statement, then there's a two millisecond gap, and then the dish prints no. So here you can, of course, imagine that this is production hardware check is happening in this two millisecond gap. And we as the attacker, we want this user terminal to believe that it is development hardware instead of production hardware. And how do we do this? We do this with fault injection. So we're going to try and disrupt the normal program flow in the hopes of the user terminal printing yes and then allowing us to log in. I already mentioned that this is a flip chip packaging and that that exposes the die backside. And usually in academia, then we start thinking about the very fancy type of attacks that are easier because of this sort of packaging. So we can do laser fault injection, body bias injection, electromagnetic fault injection, and so on. And we have all of these tools in our lab at the university to do. But there's one very inconvenient thing about this hardware, and that it's very big. So all of the hardware we have to accurately position an EM probe, for example, on top of a die, or to position a laser on top of the die is not meant for PCBs that are 60 centimeters in diameter. And if you think about doing a laser fault injection attack, and you would later want to use this user terminal on a roof, 
then you would also have to move your entire laser setup on top of a roof, and that's not very convenient. Another issue we faced, of course, is that, there, that we don't have access to legitimate development kits, and the chip made by ST here, the chip we're targeting, isn't public, so we cannot buy a development kit either. We cannot even find a data sheet for this chip. Even worse, ST doesn't even make a chip publicly available that is similar to this, to, the, to whatever we're targeting. And that makes everything uh, more cumbersome and annoying. So there's a few more ways we could try to inject faults into the system. We could try to play with the clock of the system on chip. But usually in this sort of um, chip, you have a PLL that will likely eat all of your clock glitches. We can try to play with the reset line. This is a technique that people use to attack um, the Xbox 360. But then what I ended up choosing for is voltage fault injection. Now, if you've never heard of voltage fault injection, this is the very quick introduction to it. So we have a target processor that has a core voltage supply. In this case, there are four cores. The target processor also connects to DRAM, which uses a different um, voltage supply. There might be GPIOs running at 1 volt 8, for example, or some others at 3 volt 3. And there might be other peripherals that also expect their own specific voltage. But what we really want to do is we want to briefly short the core voltage supply to ground. And the way we do this is we try to remove as many of the decoupling capacitors as possible because they basically try to stabilize everything and we want the system to become unstable. Then we connect a MOSFET to this core voltage supply rail and by opening the MOSFET we create a short to ground, sinking away all of the current from the chip and hopefully inducing a glitch. Now there's some challenges here. Um, the first one is locating the core voltage supply. So we're working here with a black box target. We have no schematics, no data sheets. Um, so what you'd use is you use the digital multimeter and some educated guessing. So you can look at, for example, a quad core Cortex A53 made by a different manufacturer, and then look at what sort of core voltage supply they're running from. And in this way, you can then make some guesses. You also have to determine which decoupling capacitors you're going to remove. There might be a lot of them, um, a lot of different values as well. So we'll remove none of them, all of them, or only some of them. And all of these decisions you make will have an impact on the effectiveness of your glitch. You have to select a MOSFET um, to perform the glitch itself. And there's a few parameters here that you, you want to pay attention to while selecting the MOSFET. Um, don't worry about this too much. Uh, if you have questions about this, then, then send me an email. Then the most difficult part of doing voltage fault injection is finding the correct parameters for your glitch. So we need a timing reference. This is usually what we call our trigger signal. Um, this can be a GPIO pin, this can be UR data, this can be data being read from the EMC and so on. It's just to acquire a stable point in time as a reference. From the timing reference, we wait a certain amount of time, our glitch offset. At that point, we enable the glitch MOSFET for a certain amount of time, the glitch width, and then we hope that some glitch occurs. Of course, if you make the glitch width too wide, then the entire system just crashes and reboots. And here the magic is then, of course, to find a suitable timing reference, an offset, and a width. So this is how we started. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we were trying to glitch the development login enable prompt. At that stage, the entire user terminal is already fully booted, meaning that all four cores are running at a high clock frequency. And the way we usually design these chips is that we try to push them to the very limit. You want your processor to run as fast as it possibly can. And this means that it's already very close to crashing. And this means it's also easier to inject faults. So we use a chip as per light um, to start our experiments. Um, if you haven't used one of these, I noticed that they have some um, upstairs in the IoT village that you can play with. And it does basically the same principle. It has the MOSFET on board, it has an FPGA that controls all of these glitch parameters, and you can configure it to Python. So as I said, the system is already fully booted, it's pretty unstable, so we can leave all of the decoupling capacitors simply on the board. And then we do some attempts and hope to get lucky. This is one example of what might happen. So the dish prints development login enabled, it even prints yes, but at the same time, we caused the kernel no pointer dereference error and the entire system came crashing down. So this was not a useful glitch for us. But if you try this often enough, then eventually you do get lucky. The dish prints development log enabled yes, you log in with the username root and the password falcon, and now you can start doing whatever you want. At this point, I reported this issue to the SpaceX 
They even reproduced it in their lab. Um, and it was a nice proof of concept to begin with because it was easy to produce some faults, but most of them are undesirable. So the issue with this attack is that it's slow because you only get one glitching attempt every boot cycle and an entire boot cycle takes about 12 seconds. It would take many hours, maybe a day before you get lucky once, and that's of course not a very practical attack. So what we want to do is we want to move up into the boot chain, so glitch earlier in the boot cycle, and then we can do multiple attempts um, per second, maybe even. So the way the system is designed is we have the system on chip, and the system inside of this system on chip, we have a root of trust that consists of EVE users and a ROM bootloader. These EVE users are um, a special type of memory, basically bits that you can only set once from zero to one, and they can never go back from one to zero, in theory. Um, so in theory, everything that's outside of this system on chip and outside of this trust boundary should be considered untrusted. The root of trust public key and the security state fuses are blown during manufacturing. So you as a consumer, when you buy one of these user terminals, you have no control over this data. As I said, it should be impossible to revert a blown fuse. There are certain techniques that might make it possible, but those are usually considered out of scope. And of course, it must, care must be taken when blowing additional fuses. If you think of, of an attacker that gains maybe code execution on the user terminal, it shouldn't be super easy for them to blow additional fuses in areas of e-fuse memory that have already been blown. If I as an attacker can, for example, blow additional bits in the root of trust public key, then maybe I can come up with a key pair that allows me to sign my own firmware. When you initially boot a system on chip, usually the first part of uh, code that is run is the ROM bootloader. It's baked in during manufacturing, it is immutable, and it loads and verifies the second stage, which is on the EMMC memory. So external memory, it is untrusted. The security state fuses um, are the first few fuses in eFuse memory, and they basically allow or disallow debugging access. These fuses are never read by software and are basically only read by a hardware peripheral very early on in the boot cycle. This might be another interesting target um, for attack. But what we decided to attack is loading the second stage bootloader. So the way this happens is the ROM bootloader loads a certificate from the external EMMC memory. This certificate is a custom format in this case, um, designed by SD Microelectronics. The magic value is shown on the slides. It contains some rollback counters to um, yeah, have rollback prevention. Then there's um, a SHA digest of the signed firmware, basically, and then, of course, a signature over this digest. So the ROM bootloader will first verify the certificate's signature. If that signature is valid, then it will load the second stage firmware from the EMMC, and then it will verify that the hash in, this, in the certificate actually matches what was loaded from EMMC. Now, if you've done fault injection before, there's a few obvious locations here that you could try to attack. You could try to attack the signature verification, or you could try to attack um, the hash comparison. Here again, we face multiple challenges. We don't have any documentation. We don't have data sheets of the chip. We don't even have data sheets of similar chips. Um, and we don't have any open or unfused samples that you can experiment with. So most commonly when we do an attack like this, we would buy a development board, run our own code on that development board, and then we have some control over what, what is going on. So we can also not run our own test program here. So commonly we would make a, a simple dummy program with some nested for loops that count basically, and then that allow us to observe the final counter outcome. Then if you know if you can corrupt this counter output, then you have some good glitch parameters that you can then use on your actual target. We can also not dump and reverse engineer the ROM bootloader to figure out what the code is doing exactly. But once we get the attack working, we can dump the ROM bootloader. We do know that some of the later stages, so BL2 onwards, are based on trusted firmware A. And from that, we can sort of assume that the ROM bootloader will have a similar structure. And this is helpful. Now, here are some tricks of the trade that you can apply if you're faced with a similar black box scenario. So what you can do is you can boot with a second stage that is invalid, 
and observe differences in how the entire system is booting. So you can, for example, use a, an invalid certificate signature, an invalid bootloader hash in a certificate, or a valid certificate, but finally a bootloader firmware that doesn't match the hash in that certificate. And by doing all of these experiments, you can see how the boot flow changes and then try to determine which action is happening when in time. So then we can also attempt to glitch a valid certificate into a signature verification failure. So this normally wouldn't happen, but by doing this, you can verify that the range of glitch widths you're using is at least valid. And this is something that is usually very easy to achieve. You can imagine if there's a single bit flip in a signature, the signature check should fail. So this is an easy effect to cause. And then finally, side channels are very useful information. So you can measure power consumption, EM emanations from the chip, maybe timing differences, temperature of the chip, and so on. There's a lot of side channels that can give you a lot of useful information. And then there's one important thing to remember. Um, hardware and the software executing on it can be susceptible to glitches in multiple unexpected ways. And usually the mental model we as attackers use to try and attack something is very likely to be incorrect. And it's important to be try and be exhaustive with all of the experiments you do. So this code example is an example that I used for, um, for a simple demo in our lab at some point. It's a simple password um, comparison check. In this case, it is constant time, so you cannot do a side channel attack on it. But when you ask most people, how are you going to glitch it? They will say, I will target the if branch that checks the accumulator. And that's one valid way of attacking this code. But the easier way of attacking this code is skipping the entire for loop, because then the accumulator stays at zero and you just fall through the branch. And in practice, this is usually easier than um, skipping the if. So this is the initial setup we made, um, where we have the user terminal. In the top right, you can see an EM probe sitting in the location of the four CPU cores. So that's our side channel in this case. Um, now I did remove all of the decoupling capacitors. So um, in the red um, rectangles, there used to be decoupling capacitors. In this case, I removed them because now we're targeting the ROM bootloader. The ROM bootloader is being executed by a single core running at a much lower clock frequency. And that makes the, list, the system less susceptible to these glitches. And then we need to remove these decoupling capacitors to have a better effect, basically. This is a, a capture of a side channel trace, in this case, the EM side channel, um, with the UART output that is being provided by the user terminal. So at this point, the user terminal is saying, I've loaded the certificate, I'm going to start verifying the signature. And you can already see clearly here from the EM side channel trace that the computation of the signature verification is already starting when the last byte of UART data is still being sent out by the UART peripheral. And this is very useful for us to have as an attacker, this information, because that means that we might have to start glitching way earlier than you would expect. And as it turns out, if you glitch this with the exact um, correct parameters and at the exact time where the signature verification starts, then you can skip the entire signature verification. So here, the, um, the, again, we see the same point in time basically as before. The dish prints, I've loaded a certificate, I'm going to start verifying it. Here it basically says, I've loaded a certificate, it's verified, without doing any verification. And for us as the attacker, that's of course very useful, because now whatever we use as a second stage will be executed. From that, we have control, um, so now we have control over the second stage bootloader, meaning that we can start modifying it. So in this case, I modified the normal second stage to start dumping some memory regions. And this way I was able to dump the ROM bootloader from the chip and also the EVE users. Um, I used that ROM bootloader dump and emulated in Unicorn Engine. I tried fuzzing it with AFL++ in Unicorn mode. My hope here was to find a software exploitable um, bug, of course, so that I wouldn't have to glitch the user terminal every single time, but that didn't work out. As you can imagine, um, the trusted firmware project has been fussed quite a lot by now. Another thing I was able to do in Unicorn is to skip um, or skip certain instructions as a way of simulating the glitches we've been inserting. And I noticed that a single instru instruction skip fault would never result in the uh, behavior we observed. And this was because SpaceX or ST Microelectronics had actually implemented countermeasures in the ROM bootloader against the exact attack we're doing here. 
And this, again, brings me back to my previous point that the mental model that was used here to implement the countermeasures do not match reality. So a model of you can only skip one instruction probably doesn't apply to a seven-stage pipeline processor. Here you can see one of the countermeasures at work. So the dish first prints some output saying, I've loaded the certificate and I'm going to start verifying it. In this case, the certificate contains an invalid signature with a valid digest for the second stage bootloader. Here you can see that our glitch sort of worked because we continue and we load um, the second stage firmware and the hash matches. And then usually the, second, the next step would be to actually execute the second stage bootloader. But here you can see we still get an authentication error. And this is one of the control flow checks in the ROM bootloader that actually managed to catch our glitching attempt. Here's an example of how this is implemented in the code. So at the very start of the ROM bootloader, um, two magic values are being set somewhere in memory. And then after calling um, the signature verification function, in this case, ED25519, um, this magic value is being overwritten. And then at the very end of the ROM bootloader, they again check if these values or if these memory addresses have the correct magic value. Otherwise, something fishy happened. Now I had an issue because I didn't find a vulnerability in the ROM bootloader, meaning that I would have to glitch the ROM bootloader every single time I reboot the user terminal. And this was annoying because once you remove all of the decoupling capacitors from the system, it becomes so unstable that it will not actually boot completely. So this means that you will have to disable decoupling capacitors once you're trying to glitch it and then enable them later on. And this turned out to be not an, an easy task. It required a lot of manual experiments um, so on shown on the left is a manual board, I just saw it by hand, um, that didn't work. On the right is the first prototype, prototype that did work, which is a simple interposer PCB that you solder to the target um, and that contains two MOSFETs to switch on capacitor banks. So I experimented with a lot of different types of MOSFETs, um, doing high side switching and low side switching, different gate voltages, different MOSFET drivers, different sizes of capacitors and so on. But so what did end up working for me is um, bigger capacitors. So using bigger capacitors actually helped um, make it easier to get the desired effect. Normally in a system like this, you um, use different capacitor sizes because each of them, all of them have a different frequency response and you try to um, yeah, have a wide coverage over the entire frequency spectrum. So in this case, 47 microfarad and 100 microfarad capacitors um, seemed to have the most positive influence. All of the 100 nanofarad and 1 microfarad capacitors that were spread around over the board um, didn't seem to really help. Um. So what I ended up using are two reverse orientation and channel MOSFETs as high side switches. Some electrical engineers might start swearing at me now, um, but you can't argue with the root shell. Now, the reason I ended up doing this is N-channel MOSFETs are usually used as low side switches, but they have a way lower RDS on value. So I use them as high side switches anyway, and because we're only switching one volt, that's not much of an issue. Having them in reverse orientation gives us the advantage that we can use the body diode to keep the decoupling capacitors semi-charged, basically, even if the MOSFETs are off. And then I also ended up using a 12 volt MOSFET driver to switch these on and off. So now I had a full attack working. I could glitch the ROM bootloader. I could patch all of the consecutive bootloader stages and so on and end up in a root shell. So I had demonstrated the full attack in the lab, um, but you can imagine this setup is really quite bulky. I had a big oscilloscope attached to it. I had multiple power supplies and signal generators attached to it and so on. And that's not very convenient on a roof. But either way, I reported this to SpaceX and they said, oh, that's very cool. We can send you a YubiKey with an SSH key on it so you can log into your user terminal so you don't have to go through this effort again. <laughs> I decided to not accept this offer because I was already way too far down the rabbit hole. So I decided I was going to make a mobile setup or a mod chip in this case. And I started replacing my lab, expensive lab equipment with low cost off the shelf components. So what you see here is basically the first prototype um, of the working mobile setup, you could say. It uses a Raspberry Pi Pico, which is a $5 microcontroller board 
Um, and in this case, it replaces the oscilloscope and allows me to trigger on the UART signals. This works, but as you can see, it's still pretty messy. So what I wanted to do was make a mod chip that we can solder on the board and then yeah, do the attack automatically in system. So what I ended up doing is putting the entire user terminal under a scanner. As you can see, it's still way too big even to fit under there. Then you end up with a nice picture that you can draw a board out outline on in Inkscape. This outline you can load in KiCad and then you can start designing your PCB. This is the finished product. Um, you can also come and watch it up close after the talk on the user terminal. So it has castellated holes that allow you to mount the, user, uh, the mod chip on the PCB, basically on existing um, footprints. And there are two types of MOSFETs. Two are used to enable and dis disable deco uh, decoupling capacitor banks. And the second one is to insert the actual glitch. Then there's a two-channel MOSFET driver to drive all of these MOSFETs. And we have the RP2040 microcontroller overclocked to 250 megahertz um, to actually generate all of the signals. So I made some code using the programmable I.O. modules that allows to trigger and generate glitches. Now, one of the goals for this project is that also other people can um, experiment with their user terminal and try to explore the networking side of this entire system. Because as you've probably figured out by now, I'm not really much of a, of a networking expert. Um, so because of that, I made the design open source. It's available on GitHub. So you can download the Gerber's, get a PCB produced go through the effort of actually installing it and getting it working. But at that point, you can have root on your user terminal and start interacting with the network side. This is a picture of the mod chip installed on the board. So there's still a few wires you have to solder. One wire is to um, an enable pin of the core voltage regulator. And this allows you to power cycle the user terminal. I'm also leaching 12 volt from the board to, um, yeah, for the MOSFET driver. And then there's one volt eight for a level shifter. Then we got this mounting system made so that we could um, put the user terminal outside of the window of our lab. And that was a lot more convenient than having to go up to the roof every time something broke. Um, and in this way, we had a working internet connection. So we were connected to the Starlink system on a rooted user terminal. And at this time, I made a mistake because I was reading Reddit. And yeah, never trust Reddit. Um, someone posted that a lot of the recent firmware updates made the connections a lot more stable. And as you can see here, I have the user terminal just flat pointing up to the sky. So there's no even rough alignment towards the satellite. So my connection wasn't really stable. So I decided, okay, let's do a firmware update. I had a bug in the ROM bootloader. I was convinced there was no way SpaceX could ever fix this without replacing the hardware. But as it turned out, SpaceX still had one e-fuse that they could blow. And blowing this e-fuse made sure that the user terminal would never output anything over the UART. And I was using UART to trigger on. This was my timing reference. But as you can, can imagine, this was very annoying. In hindsight, I should have known this beforehand because I had emulated the ROM bootloader and I had looked at what all of the fuses were used for. And this fuse I had ma marked as unknown. But this means that we have to improvise, adapt, and overcome. Luckily, I already had a lot of information from doing the attack before. So I had logic analyzer captures of all of the interesting signals. And I could make new logic analyzer captures of after the fuse had been blown. Then I can start comparing these. And then, of course, the side channel information we had was very useful. All I really had to do is make new captures, find the same looking EM side channel pattern, and then I again had my timing reference. And instead of using the UART as a timing reference or a trigger signal, I now use um, the data zero line of the EMMC. So basically, when the certificate is being shifted from the EMMC to the system on chip, I have a timing reference. From there, I wait and insert a glitch. So after a day or two, um, I was back in the system. Um, luckily, I could reuse my mod chip. I just had to solder a, a bodge wire basically to it that now connects to the data zero line. Um, I had to change some parameters in a Python script, and then we were back in. The alternative here, of course, would have been to make a new PCB design, but that seemed a bit um, cumbersome. Now, at this point, you can start exploring the networking side of things. This is where stuff should get really interesting, but it's not really getting easier here, because all of the communication with backend servers is using mutually authenticated TLS, where the client-side authentication is handled by um, the SD-safe secure element meaning that none of the standard tools 
have support for this. Um, so you cannot simply proxy the traffic through burp or something like that. That will not work. I ended up adding SD safe support in the TLS Lite and G TLS implementation. This is a pure Python implementation. Um, so I have Python running on the user terminal. And I made a script that allows me to download the latest firmware image whenever I want. So now if someone posts on Reddit that they have a new firmware update, I can first download it and look at it to see if I really want to apply it or not. And this way I've also started making my own update archive, which is convenient if you want to compare how things are changing over time. Now what I really should have done instead of using TLS Lite and G, I should have probably implemented SD safe support in boring SSL because most of the communication with backend services is over gRPC and I currently don't have an easy way to integrate um, all of that. All of the backend communication so far I've seen is over IPv6, meaning it's also not really easy to scan the entire network. Um, but here's one endpoint you can find once you get root on your user terminal and I've also listed a few ports that you can try and play with. So what's next? Um, you can all go home and make your own modchip, open up your user terminal, install it, get root, and then start playing with the network infrastructure. Um, you can also interact with the digital beamformers, so these um, special chips that are on this user terminal. This is, I believe, one of the first consumer-grade electronics that actually has this sort of um, military-grade, you could say, um, RF equipment in there. So I know a lot of people are interested in playing with that. You might even be able to repurpose your user terminal. Maybe you can try building a point-to-point -point link with two user terminals or something like that. I think there's a lot of fun to be had still. So to conclude, we can bypass secure boot using voltage fault injection in the ROM bootloader. We did this in a quad-core Cortex A53 processor in a completely black box scenario. We didn't have any documentations or, op or open development kits. We had to figure out a way to enable and disable the coupling capacitors to be able to glitch the ROM bootloader and um, boot the entire system fully. And then of course, these fault injection countermeasures that were implemented are only as good as the fault model that was used. I think this is a very well-designed product, at least from a security standpoint. Um, I didn't find any obvious, or at least to me obvious, low-hanging fruit. And I think this is a device that a lot of device manufacturers can um, learn from. In contrast, yeah, so like I said, in contrast to many other devices, getting a root shell here was already challenging. And then once you get the root shell, it doesn't really become easier from there. So in the past, when I've looked at other IoT or embedded devices, oftentimes it takes you an hour to get a root shell. And then once you have that root shell, everything starts crumbling. As I mentioned earlier, I've reported all of these vulnerabilities to SpaceX. Um, they have a bug bounty program. They're very responsive and easy to reach. And as a response to this research, they also um, uploaded a six-page PDF document explaining how they try to secure their entire system and so on. Now, some people ask me, how can they actually stop you from doing this attack? So I made a slide that says, how to annoy me. If they had disabled all of the UART output from the start, so if they had blown that fuse from the beginning, then I would have a lot less information. Um, I might have not initially seen that it's using trusted firmware, for example. You could also have encrypted all of the EMMC contents. Then again, I would have a lot less information. I wouldn't have been able to look at the firmware, and I wouldn't have known that they're using a trusted firmware implementation. You can also try to react when a fault is detected. They clearly have countermeasures that can detect some types of faults. So maybe they can try to use these to, um, for example, blow a fuse or increment a monotonic fuse counter. Then if the system does boot fully, it can check if this fuse was blown or not and then maybe send the report to their backend. And they clearly have all of the monitoring um, capabilities for this implemented. Another thing you can do is insert random delays. That screws up my timing. So I have a timing reference. If there's a random delay in between when the actual operation is happening, then the odds of the attack working become a lot smaller. Another technique is called lockstep. This is where you run the same code on two processors at the same time, and you try to compare the outcome of these two um, processors. Now, none of these things are foolproof, and with a lot of effort, they can probably still be bypassed. But here we're reaching a point where it might be frustrating enough for some attackers, and probably also me, to just pick a different target and move on. Now, before I really end this talk, um, I'm going to attempt to do a live demo. This is tricky for some reasons, as you can imagine. 
Um, so off we go. So on the left, we have a control script. It's a simple Python script that talks to the um, mod chip on the board. It's basically sending commands. It's orchestrating everything. It's setting glitch parameters. It's turning off the user terminal on again, arming the glitch, and so on. Um, as you can see, it takes about one second for each attempt now, instead of the 12 that we had before. The annoying thing about a glitching demo is that it's very difficult to predict how long it's going to take. It has never taken me longer than five minutes, <laughs> and sometimes it only takes 10 seconds. So that's yeah, very annoying. Um, on the right, you can see the serial output from the user terminal. And this user terminal has the UART fuse blown, and that's why you don't see any output now. So previously, before the e-fuse was blown, you would see a lot of scrolling text, and the user terminal would basically repeatedly say, signature verification error. Now, while we wait for this um, attempt, and hopefully we get lucky soon, maybe I can already start answering a question. So if anyone has a question, then... Uh, Let's start by giving him a round of applause. <laughs> In the meanwhile, who wants the first question? Who has a question? Who is smart enough to ask a question? Uh, we, we got partially lucky with the demo. I think we'll have to try again. So uh, what happened here is um, switching on the coupling capacitors is a really tricky process. And here it sort of worked, so the glitch worked. We got into the second stage bootloader, it started executing, with them on trying to um, yeah, run the next stage, basically the entire system failed. Hopefully we get lucky again quick enough. I did the same demo at Black Hat, there it took, um, I think, 100 seconds, which was quite frightening on stage. Um, <laughs> At DEF CON, the demo actually failed, um, so let's, let's see what happens. What? Yeah, of course, the ultimate goal would be to hack a satellite, um, oh. but I'm not sure I'll find the time for that, and I'm not sure how realistic it is. Um, in, the, in the bug bounty program, they're open to it, but they say that if you believe to have identified a vulnerability that might affect the satellite, they ask you to reported before actually trying something so that they can, uh, can coordinate everything. Um, but yeah, that would of course be the, the ultimate end goal. And that's also what I hope other people will start looking at now. I don't know much about networking stuff, so I hope in this way other people can, can look at the networking side. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you for killing the time. <laughs> Did you try to glitch the bootloader as well to get into a U-boot or? Um, so uh, yeah, by doing, so the first attack was at the very end of the boot cycle. And of course you could move up step by step towards the first um, stage. I did consider doing that, um, but it sort of has the same issue as finding a software vulnerability. Like once you find it and you report it, SpaceX is going to fix it and you will lose access. Um, so that's why I immediately went for the first ROM bootloader, because I know I, they cannot fix this without replacing the hardware. But l let's say you get the U-boot access. Um, because of secure boot, would it be difficult to move to the uh, kernel, actually? Um, I, I think at that point, if you have U-boot access and, it, and it, it loads the fit, then you can still change the kernel command line arguments, probably, and just boot in single user mode and then end up in the root shell. I think that would be possible, yeah. So now here we have fully booted user terminal, um, and we can log in with the username root and the password falcon, and we are root. And then you can do, for example, um, log the messages that are being printed during boot. There's a lot of information here. Um, some of the stuff is interesting. So for example, um, one thing that they did change in recent firmware updates is that the entire surface of the, of the phased array is being split into multiple antennas. So one antenna beam can follow a satellite that is flying over, while the next one is already steering to the next satellite. And these logs, for example, print which exact satellite you're connecting to. And if you look online at satellite trackers, you can actually see the satellite that's flying over at this point, that it, that's the satellite your user terminal is connecting to. So that was it for the demo. Um, if there's more questions, then. <laughs> 
No, it's not a mitigation, and in most cases, that, that password doesn't really matter, um, because as long as it's not development hardware, it won't accept any password anyway. Yeah. All right, if there are not any more questions, last, okay, one more. In one of the photographs, you showed a probe attached to the CPU cord. Uh, what was the purpose of that? So that is an, um, it's basically an antenna that picks up the EM emanations generated by the chip while it's operating. And the other end of this, or the cable of this antenna is connected to an oscilloscope. And it allows us to create these, the, the blue capture basically shown here on the slide. And that's side channel information, and in this case, that was very useful to determine, like you can, you can see here at the very beginning of the slide, so here toward the left, that it looks like the CPU is not doing that much. And the reason it's not doing that much is because it's sending out bytes to the UART peripheral, and then waiting for that byte to be sent out, and then sending the next byte. And so this waiting has a, yeah, a different pattern to it than actual computations. And so you can also see here that while the last byte is being sent out, it's already starting to compute things. And in this case, we wanted to glitch at the very start of the signature verification to skip it entirely. And this EM side channel allows us to determine exactly where that beginning is. Because if you were to base your guess on this UART output, then maybe you would have started glitching at the red line instead of the black one. That's the purpose of this antenna. If there are more questions, now is the time. Oh, wait, there's a question. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, it's not a question, actually. Uh, so you, you hacked the Tesla, and no Starlink. The next step, uh, Neuralink, or? Maybe if they once finish it, then, uh, yeah, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.